Take a look at this graph. It shows an increase in young American teenagers' rates of depression with a notable uptick, especially in girls, since around 2010. It, and studies like it, are at the centre of a debate around social media and mental health. Findings like this have been replicated in many countries, that in a worrying number of studies, reports of mental health problems, depression, anxiety, self-harm, suicide and so on, have almost tripled. Psychologist Jonathan Hayde argues that the timing is clear. The cause is social media. Others have pointed to the 2008 financial crash, climate change, worries about the future, and similar phenomena. But Haid asks, why would this affect teenage girls in particular? He points to Facebook's own research, leaked by the whistleblower Frances Haugen. She secretly copied tens of thousands of pages of Facebook internal research. Who said teens themselves blame Instagram for increases in the rate of anxiety and depression. This reaction was unprompted and consistent across all groups. In 2011, in surveys, around one in three teenage girls reported experiencing persistent sadness or hopelessness. Today, the American CDC Youth Risk Survey reports that 57% do. In some studies, shockingly, 30% of young people say they've considered suicide, up from 19%. At least 55 studies have found a significant correlation between social media and mood disorders. A study of 19,000 British children found the prevalence of depression was strongly associated with time spent on social media. Many studies have found that watching television or Netflix is not the problem. It's specifically social media. Of course, causation rather than correlation is difficult to prove. Social media has become ubiquitous over a period in time in which the world has changed in many other ways. Who's to say it's not fear of existential threats from climate change or inequality or global politics or even a more acute focus on mental health more broadly? But Hayde points out that the correlation between social media use and mental health problems is greater than that between childhood exposure to lead and brain developmental problems, which was a significant correlation and worse than that of between binge drinking and overall health. And both of these things, importantly, are things we address. Hayde argues that all of these studies 55 at least, and many, many more that are related in some way are not just random noise. He says a consistent story is emerging from these hundreds of correlational studies. Instagram was founded in 2010, just before that uptick, and the iPhone 4 was released at the same time, the first phone with a front-facing camera. I mean, this will have a lasting impact on the way that we actually connect with each other. I remember when it was considered cringe to take a selfie. It also makes sense qualitatively. School-aged children are particularly sensitive to social dynamics, bullying, and ideas about self-worth. And now they're suddenly bombarded with celebrity images, idealized body shapes and beauty standards, endless images and videos to compare themselves to others on demand. And on top of this, social networks like Instagram display the size of your social group for all of your peers to see. How many people liked you? How many like your next post? Your comments? And more importantly, as a result, how many people don't like you? Social media is popularity quantified for everyone in the schoolyard to see. One study, which designed an app which imitated Instagram, found that those exposed to images manipulated to look extra attractive reported lower self-body image in the period after. 
Another study looked at the rollout of Facebook to university campuses in its early years and compared the time periods with studies of mental health, finding that when Facebook was introduced to an area, symptoms of mental health, especially depression, increased. Another looked at specific areas as high-speed internet was introduced to those areas, making social media more accessible, and then looked at the corresponding hospital data. They concluded that we find a positive and significant impact on girls, but not on boys. Exploring the mechanism behind these effects, we show that high-speed internet increases addictive internet use and significantly decreases time spent sleeping, doing homework and socialising with family and friends. Girls, again, power all these effects. Young girls, for various reasons, seem to be especially affected. However, the reasons why are difficult to establish although idealised beauty standards are one obvious answer. One epidemiologist, Yvonne Kelly, said one of the big challenges with using information about the amount of time spent on social media is that it isn't possible to know what's going on for young people and what they're encountering whilst online. Ironically, I've re-uploaded this video several times because YouTube have decided that discussing the issues in the following section are against their guidelines. I cannot describe how frustrating I find this, and as a result, I've replaced references to a very serious, specific, tragic issue with the phrase, very serious mental health issues, which just doesn't fully capture what I'm referring to at all. I'll personally be thinking more carefully about how to navigate this in the future, and to put it mildly, I really hope YouTube thinks more carefully about its approach too. In 2017, here in the UK, a 14-year-old girl, Molly Russell, took her own life after looking at posts about serious mental health issues. As The Guardian reported, quote, In a groundbreaking verdict, the coroner ruled that the negative effects of online content contributed to Molly's death. The report said that, Out of the 16,300 pieces of content that Molly interacted with on Instagram in the six months before she died, 2,100 were related to suicide, self-harm and depression. It also emerged that Pinterest, the image sharing platform, had sent her content recommendation emails with titles such as 10 depression pins you might like. Studies have found millions of posts of the issue on Instagram with one hashtag having around 50,000 posts each month. A Swansea University study, which included respondents with a history of these issues and of those without, found that 83% of them had been recommended the content on Instagram and TikTok without searching for it. For most of us, it all starts with our For You feeds. And three quarters experienced even more serious problems as a result of seeing that content. One researcher said that she jumped on Instagram to see how fast she could get to an image which contained the problems, and it took her about a minute and a half. According to an EU study, 7% of 11 to 16 year olds have visited websites that encourage serious mental health issues. These are websites, forums and groups that encourage and often explicitly admire serious harm. One Tumblr blog posts footage, notes, and admiration. Many communities have their own language, codes, and slang. Another study found that, to no one's surprise, those who had visited serious mental health websites and pages reported lower overall levels of self-esteem, happiness, and trust. Okay, but anything can be harmful. Crossing the road carries risks. So do many other technologies. Driving, air travel, factories, medicines, etc. But with other technologies, we do identify the risks, the harmful effects or the side effects to try and ameliorate them. 
these problems are bound up and often come into contact with other values that we hold dear, free speech, freedom for parents to raise children in the way they wish, liberal live and let live. But we usually tolerate intervention when there's a clear risk of harm. Our most common framework for thinking about liberal interventionism comes from the British philosopher John Stuart Mill's harm principle, that we can do what we like as long as it doesn't harm others, that my freedom to swing my fist ends at your face. Mill wrote, the only purpose for which power can be rightly exercised over any member of a civilised community against his will is to prevent harm to others. We, and usually the police or government, prevent violence before it happens, investigate threats, make sure food and medicine and other consumer products aren't harmful or poisonous. We regulate and have safety codes to make sure technology, transport and buildings and medicine are safe. So, to make sense of all of this, I want to start from cases where social media has actually harmed in some way, and then work backwards from there. One of the problems, as we'll see, is that it's not always clear where to draw the line, or how to draw it. First, is there even any such thing as a harmful post? After all, a post is not the same as violence. It might encourage, endorse, promote, lead to, or raise the likelihood of harm. But it's not harm itself. As Jonathan Rauch has said, if words are just as violent as bullets, then bullets are only as violent as words. But in other contexts, we do intervene before the harm is done. We don't allow false advertising or leaving ingredients that might be harmful off labels. We have libel laws. We arrest and prosecute for planning violence, even though it hasn't yet been carried out. We do for threats too. There are many cases where words and violence collide. We could call it edge speech or edge words. They're right at the edge of where an abstract word signals that something physical is about to be done in the world. Like, I'm about to hit you. During the Syrian civil war, which started in 2011, at least 570 British citizens traveled to Syria to fight, many of them for ISIS. The leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, called for Sunni youths around the world to come and fight in the war, saying, I appeal to the youths and men of Islam around the globe and invoke them to mobilize and join us to consolidate the pillar of the state of Islam and wage jihad. ISIS had a pretty powerful social media presence. One recruitment video was called There's No Life Without Jihad. They engaged in a 1 billion social media campaign to try and raise 1 billion fighters. They had a free app to keep up with ISIS news called The Dawn of Glad Tidings. And they used Twitter to post many, many pictures, including pictures of beheadings. The world has been shocked by the advance of ISIS, the Islamic State of Iraq and the Sham. But this is the story of their advance on a different type of territory, onto people's Twitter timelines. What was called the Billion Campaign, with its hashtags, led to 22,000 tweets on Twitter within four days. The hashtag All Eyes on ISIS on Twitter had 30,000 tweets. ISIS posted a new message on Twitter overnight, calling on sympathizers to strike the soldiers, strike their police, security and intelligence members in the West. One account had almost 18,000 followers, its tweets viewed over 2 million times a month, with two-thirds of foreign ISIS fighters following it. Ultimately, the UK government alone requested the removal of 15,000, quote, jihadist propaganda posts. Or take another example, what's been called gangbanging. Homicides in the UK involving 16 to 24 year olds have risen by more than 60% in the past five years. There's an increasing number of stories of provocation through platforms like Snapchat. 
In one instance in the UK, a 13-year-old was stabbed to death by two other 13 and 14-year-olds after an escalation involving bragging about knives which began on Snapchat. In another, a 16-year-old was filmed dying on Snapchat after being stabbed. One London youth worker told Vice, Snapchat is the root of a lot of problems. I hate it. It's full of young people calling each other out, boasting of killings and stabbings, winding up rivals, disrespecting others. Another said, some parts of Snapchat are 24-7 gang culture. It's like watching a TV show on social media with both sides going at it to see who can be more extreme, who can be hardest. Vice has reported that much gang violence now plays out on Snapchat in some way, with posts being linked to reputation, impressing people, threatening, humiliating, boasting, and of course, eventually, in many cases, escalating. Youth worker and author Kieran Thapar said, when someone gets beaten up on a Snapchat video to sustain their position in the ecosystem, they have to counter that evidence with something more extreme, and social media provides space to do that. It is that phenomenon that's happening en masse. And the head of policing in the UK has also warned that social media was driving children to increasing levels of violence. Or take another example, controversial hate speech laws. The UN says, In common language, hate speech refers to offensive discourse targeting a group or an individual based on inherent characteristics such as race, religion or gender, and that may threaten social peace. This latter part is often forgotten, that the point of hate speech laws rightly or wrongly, whether you disagree or agree, as we'll get to, is to address threats of harm before they happen. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which many countries have adopted, and most in Europe at least have similar laws to, declares that, quote, in that exercise of their rights and freedoms, everyone shall be subject only to such limitations as are determined by law solely for the purpose of securing due recognition and respect for the rights and freedoms of others and of meeting the just requirements of morality, public order and the general welfare in a democratic society. Problems with us. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists and some, I assume, are good people. But exceptions include any advocacy of national, racial or religious hatred that constitutes incitement to discrimination, hostility or violence shall be prohibited by law. These laws were developed after the Nazi atrocities during World War II and it was argued that laws of this type, now called hate speech laws, were necessary because the threat of harm from things like genocide was so great. In other words, they're an extension of John Stuart Mill's harm principle. The UN's David Kay has written that the point of Article 20 was to prohibit expression where the speaker intended for his or her speech to cause hate in listeners who would agree with the hateful message and therefore engage in harmful acts towards the targeted group. It wasn't meant to ban speech that caused offence, but to prevent speech that would clearly lead to violence. Of course, the problem is that this is very difficult to define, but by many metrics, speech loosely defined as hate speech has increased over the past few years. In Western countries, including New Zealand, Germany and Finland, 14 to 19 percent of people report having been harassed online at some point. A 2020 study in Germany found that observations of hate speech online had almost doubled from 34 to 67 percent in the last five years, and just under 50 percent of people in the UK, US, Germany and Finland aged 15 to 35 agreed that in the past three months, have you seen hateful or degrading writings or speech online which inappropriately attacked certain groups of people or individuals? And there's been some research that's found that youth suicide attempts are lower in US states that have hate crime laws.
Okay, so when should big tech companies or the government step in? Should social media companies host self-injury groups? Should the Ku Klux Klan have a Facebook page? What's the difference between a joke and harassment? Should the police ever be involved? There's also a variety of ways of addressing issues. From banning, to hiding posts, to shadow banning and demonetizing, age restriction, to civil suits, fines and eventually prosecution. Then there's the problem of overreach. I've had this channel demonetized in its entirety before. Videos age restricted and demonetized often, which never recover in the algorithm that I spend months working on and get absolutely nothing back from. This video itself is on a sensitive topic. I wouldn't be surprised if it has problems with reach and demonetization. So if you'd like to support content like this and help me out, you can do so through the Patreon below. Okay, but how can we approach all of this? One answer I think we can rule out pretty quickly is the libertarian one. Let everyone do what they want, users and platforms alike, and social media platforms and pages will thrive or fail as a result. First, no libertarian society in history has worked. And second, even in the early days of the internet, where in effect the libertarian approach did thrive, social media companies slowly realised that if they let their platforms be full of self-harm, pornography, violence and more, that advertisers and users tend to quickly leave. So they started to self-regulate, and some say over-regulate. As a result, free speech has become a subject of fierce debate. This is, I think, for three reasons. First, that free speech is, correctly, one of our most important values. Second, that with the internet we now have more speech than ever before. And third, because in some cases, speech clearly can lead to direct harm. We've seen this. So Mental health issues, self-harm, eating disorders, depression, promotion of terrorism and gang violence, the promotion of hate speech that openly calls for fascism or genocide. So should we restrict speech of this type? First, we should acknowledge that there's no such thing as free speech absolutism. I think the very phrase is an absurdity. We already limit the fringes of speech in many ways. Threats, harassment, blackmail, libel, copyright, slander, incitement to violence, advertising standards, drug and food labeling standards, broadcasting standards. All of those are restricted in very careful ways. Furthermore, we restrict many freedoms based on the likelihood of them causing harm. Health and safety and sanitation in restaurants, building codes, speeding and drink driving laws, wider infrastructure requirements, air travel regulation, laws on weapons, knives, etc. The list goes on and on. I know regulation isn't fashionable or sexy or interesting and there are many difficulties and disagreements and overreach, but if we regulate these things, why do we not regulate social media companies when there's a significant risk of harm? I think obviously we have to be very careful, only focusing on those very edge cases, but if there's a substantial risk or if regulation can effectively reduce a risk of harm while minimising the curtailing of freedoms, then it should be done, either by institutions, companies or governments that are in a position to do so. And importantly, how this is done should be subject to democratic principles and debate. Policy analyst and author David Brommel writes, Rules that restrict the right to freedom of expression should therefore be made by democratically elected legislators through regulatory processes that enable citizens' voices. 
He continues, given the global dominance of a relatively small number of big tech companies, it is especially important that decisions about de-platforming are made within regulatory frameworks determined by democratically elected legislators and not by private companies. And none of this is to deny that it's not difficult and finding that line, striking the right balance is not complex. But in the cases I've mentioned, with the statistics as they are, to do nothing, I think, would be irresponsible. In all of them, I think the potential for harm is often as clear as the potential for harm from something like libel, for example. Does this mean that posts, forums and speech of this type should be just banned outright? Well, no, not always. Human rights expert Frank LaRue has argued that we should make clear distinctions between a. expression that constitutes an offence under international law and can be prosecuted criminally, b. expression that's not criminally punishable but may justify a restriction and a civil suit, and c. expression that does not give rise to criminal or civil sanctions but still raises concerns in terms of tolerance, civility and respect for others. In other words, context, proportionality, tiered responses, they're all important. And there are many policies that can be put into place before banning or prosecution, not amplifying certain topics, age restrictions, removing posts or demonetizing before an actual ban. Hayde argues that big tech should be compelled by law to allow academics access to their data. One example of this is the Platform Transparency and Accountability Act proposed by the Stanford University researcher Nate Persily. We could also raise the age children can use social media or force stricter rules for children's accounts and we could ban phones in schools up to a certain age. And finally, and I think most importantly, democratic means transparent, so we can all have a debate about where the line is. YouTube is terrible at this. I don't mind if a video gets demonetized or age restricted because I've broken a reasonable rule, but it's more often the case that I know I haven't, that I've been careful not to, and it happens anyway. The UK has just announced an online safety bill which addresses much of all of this, and I agree with the spirit of it. The Guardian reports that the bill imposes a duty of care on tech platforms such as Facebook, Instagram and Twitter to prevent illegal content, which will now include material encouraging self-harm being exposed to users. Today is a major milestone in the mission to create a safer life online for people across the UK. And we are absolutely ready now, Ofcom, to crack on with the implementation of these new laws. And we the communications regulator, Ofcom, will have the power to levy fines of up to 10% of a company's revenues. It makes encouragement to suicide illegal, prevents young people seeing pornography, and stronger protections against bullying and harassment, encouraging self-harm, deepfake pornography and the like. What the government is proposing is mass surveillance. It would hand power to repressive regimes the world over. No, well, no, I, I don't accept that. I mean, the... However, it also tries to force social media companies to scan private messages, which is an abhorrent breach of privacy and a reminder that giving politicians the power to decide can carry as much risk as letting a single tech billionaire decide. Which is why transparency and democratic debate is key. Uh, no. But ultimately, through gritted teeth, I remind myself that the principle remains. The more democratically decided, the better. And democratically elected politicians are one step better than non-democratically elected big tech companies. 
Thank you to all of these incredible Patreon supporters. These videos take a long time to research, write and make. I do a lot of reading. They're always sourced and there's a bibliography in the description below. I've written something short on why I think this kind of well-researched long-form content is worth supporting. It's through the link below too. If you agree, then you can support Then and I by pledging anything from a single dollar per month and get your name in credits, access to scripts early and become a member of the Discord server. If you can't do that, I know everyone says this, but please do subscribe, hit the bell, like, leave a comment. These things help with the algorithm so, so much. I'm also trying out a newsletter. I'm going to distill and summarize each video into a quick, easily digestible email for those who don't have time or want to recap, along with some related insights. Sign up below. As always, more than anything, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.